I think a ride has to be like a story. It should have sort of definable moments of drama, but also have points where you're sort of chilling and sitting back a little bit. You know, it can't all be loaded up into one kind of intense experience. It should have a rhythm. This cloud's gonna stay parked on top of us for a little bit longer, but I think we'll see dry weather before camp is the hope. My rule is to not put all my clothes on, ever. So that no matter what, no matter how miserable I am, I know I could put something else on. So, <laughs> right now I'm not wearing everything. Little rainy, little slick. Kinda have to walk the distance. Uh, feel a little better, I put some gloves on. That was good. It's not super cold, but the rain's pretty cold. But it'll it'll stop soon. <laughs> I wonder what kind of road this ever was. It's, it's, it's marked as a hiking trail, I think, or like a trail. That was amazing there. I'm one of the team of four members at CI who first proposed this idea for the Bikepacking for Conservation program. Together with my colleagues Elliot Werman, Natalia Penton, and Arcadia Lee, we applied for funding through this in-house incubator at Conservation International called the Millennium Innovation Lab, which is set up to kind of give opportunities to start projects that are maybe a bit outside of the box of what CI usually does. What started off as a very simple idea of just combining nature and cycling, <laughs> our two passions, um, and it evolved a lot from there. Since I started bikepacking, I always saw bikepacking routes as having a massive potential to tell stories about land use, conservation. They offer connection to nature like no other form of travel, in my opinion. I'm Logan Watts, I'm the founding editor of bikepacking.com and um, I helped design the route for the Chingaza Loop. We wanted to create a route that basically started and finished in Bogota and took in some of the spectacular scenery. For me it's always mountains, looking at the geographic features, trying to tie those in with cultural sites, towns that I wanted to visit, so it was a matter of taking all that information, trying to get the best track that you could do as much as possible within about a week. He provided this route. We had a general idea of the area we wanted to work in. Well, we Logan here, designed a route in that area with points of interest, yeah. and then we integrated yeah. conservation yeah. project sites to that. Here, and this is the, the most secret lagoon mm. that is called Siecha, mm. but um, difficult for bikes. It's really difficult yeah. for bikes. My name is Natalia Cero. I'm the Water and Cities Manager for Conservation International Colombia. The main focus of Water and Cities is to understand how ecosystems make a city sustainable in the future. When you think about sustainability, you think more about clean transport, uh, waste management, but then what happens if a city doesn't have water? When you ask people that live in a city of 10 million people as Bogota, where the water comes from? And they say, from the pipe. And the reality is that the water doesn't come from the pipe. The water has like a route that they make from these ecosystems here in Bogota, they are called paramos. The paramos, they are like wetlands, but they are in the high Andean mountains. Most of the paramos are above 3,000 meters above the sea level. And the frailejones, they are endemic for the paramos. They have little hairs, like you, you see them working. So when the fog comes, these little hairs capture them, and then through their system, they just drop it to the surface water. 
So drop by drop, you can see how they intercept that fog from the air and then just throw it slowly to the rivers, basically. The water that you take from the paramus is drinkable in all our indicators. That river goes to a reservoir that is called Chusa, that is in the middle of the Chingasa National Park. We have 70,000 hectares of paramos in that Chingasa Park. That's why it's so important. And then it connects to the pipe. Every house has that connection directly to the paramos. So basically you're drinking the clouds, if you want to see it that way. When you think about it, you open up your eyes and the first thing you do is go to the bathroom, brush your teeth and take a sip of water, right? So where is the connection between the citizens and nature? And I think that that connection is easy to see with water. We have been here for 10 years trying to promote that regional view on how you can conserve these ecosystems that actually provides all the things that the city needs. And it gives the difference between Bogota and other cities in Latin America is that this has water, like Bogota have water. We cannot see conservation only as we protect this ecosystem and nobody can get there. It's just for nature, it's just for animals, it's just for biodiversity. Humans are also part of the ecosystem. They should benefit from that nature. And I've always seen cyclists as natural allies. You know, you're already kind of taking this inherent sustainable choice in your life by being a cyclist. Cycling somewhere instead of driving, it's just better for the environment. You know, you're cycling up from the city into the Paramos, but then you're kind of following the trail that the water is doing, you know, kind of recreating that connection between the water and the cities. So Logan contacted me about being part of a project that I admire and that is easy to believe in. I'm Joe Cruz. I teach philosophy at Williams College. I've been there for 20 years. At the same time, and over those 20 years and even earlier, I've been bikepacking. I took my first bikepacking trip in 1988. I've been making bikepacking routes since I started doing it and thinking of what that might be like when you're sitting at home looking at map layers and, and satellite imagery and reading a history book of the, of the place you're going to visit or reading other people's accounts of having gone there. Like putting all that together is its own challenge, but also I think those of us who do it know its own very deep pleasure. Then getting on the ground and finding out that it's gone sideways or you were wrong about whether the track goes through or there's a fence there or it turns out that what looked like and the two-dimensional projection, a reasonable pitch is actually a 40-degree slope that you have to hike a bike over the whole afternoon. Right? Finding that stuff out is, is fun too, um, even if at the very moment it's happening, it can sometimes not seem like that. This is the part that Joe put in. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure. So this is your section, Joe, right? Joe's, Definitely my section. The Joe section, the venture route. Well, I'd say no bushwhack for is that, future. Is that what it looks like? Yeah. Definitely not for future. I mean, it'd be easy to reroute this because this is all kind of main road. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Turistas. Sí. Turistas. Estamos perdidos. Por aquí bajen y una y baja ninguna carretera que allá abajo hay una carretera se bajan. We're stopped by private property fences and we had to rally and regroup. Private land is probably one of the most frustrating things in route design. It happens all the time. It's infuriating. <laughs> and this was probably put up after the satellite imagery that we looked at because I definitely studied this area and didn't, didn't notice this, or possibly it was blocked by the tree from satellite, so not quite sure. Uh, but I think it's probably relatively new. It looks that way from the brickwork. But that's part of the scouting process. That's why we scout these routes. And so what we want to be able to say to people who come after us is, hey, this is going to be a pile of fun. It's been very challenging. I think we've gone through like nine iterations in the planning now. I think this thing that has surprised me the most is just how popular cycling is here and how much 
support we've gotten from the local community, which has been incredible. Obviously, we couldn't have done this without the help of Juan Pablo and Julian and the people who've recommended some tracks to kind of complete it. Oh, nice. It's nice. It's yeah. very it's same as Chingaza. It's yeah. a high elevation Paramo mm. ecosystem. Paramo. Have mm -hmm. you been in Paramo somewhere no. else? Oh, it's amazing. Oh, you will be yeah. 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 delighted. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty great. Okay. We don't rely on the snow peaks for uh, having our water, so that ecosystem is really important due to that specific plant. And that plant, they say, only grows one centimeter per year. So you will see as tall as four meter high. Those plants are even older than our own country. <laughs> you know, our country is 200 years old and you will see them and, and they take a lot of time. So they, they, they need to be conserved and, and you will see how big it is and, and how, how majestic is that place itself. Can you take a look at this other? Yeah. Well, good. It sounds like we're on the right track. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Juan Pablo. During the week when I train, I can go to a Paramo just in one hour, I'm there. I love the noise of silence, you know. The silence in these places are, is amazing. I just love it. What I like the most from bikepacking is the freedom feeling. You can go wherever you want, you're very light, and I love just to camp wherever the night gets to you. We have secondary roads all around where you can just get lost in nature and enjoy. <laughs> My name is Julian Manrique. Every Colombian starts with a normal 26 rim bike and they start on the Ciclovia maybe, that's how I started, like riding through the town, riding small amounts of distances, not too much stuff. One and a half million people come out on the streets every Sunday with no politics, no money, no religion, but only because each one feels the main actor on that scene that Ciclovia is for anyone in the city. Do people know you, you are responsible for this movement? Don't know. Don't know. Don't know. But uh, I imagine, I mean, I'm not that big a shot. But uh, I am Jaime Ortiz Marino, I'm an architect, and I've been since the 70s an activist on urban cycling. With a friend, a colleague architect, we proposed the city, the closure of the streets. So the first time Bogotá closed the streets for cyclists and pedestrians to come out on them, it was on the 15th of December of 1974. Since then, Ciclovia has had a big evolution and is now part of the identity, is an icon of the city, and is being uh, repeated throughout the world. There are more than 450 cities throughout the world that use the same strategy. Many of them rode their first bicycle on the Ciclovia and realized that he could cross the city. I mean, the 10 miles is not a long distance to ride a bicycle. And Ciclovia has given the chance to many people to realize what they're capable of doing. And the great thing about a bicycle is that anyone can afford it, can ride it, and definitely enjoy it. Road cycling became very popular a couple of years ago when Nairo Quintana and Esteban Chavez and all these important cyclists started to win all of these races. There are so many paths and so many roads and so many mountains to discover that we started like getting interest into getting to the back roads and discovering what's behind our own city. Colombia has a lot of things. Colombia has uh, culture, Colombia has coffee, Colombia has uh, typical dances and uh, everywhere and uh, special food and some stuff that people do not realize is what nature is surrounding you. Colombia is the number one uh, country of species of birds in the world, and we have at least 1,800 species, and we're surrounded by them everywhere. 
we use cycling as a tool because we don't have seasons, we rely on thermal floors. As soon as you start climbing, the thermal floors start to change and the life within those thermal floors also changes. So that happens with birds a lot. As you start climbing, you will see different species of birds. And if you go to the paramos, you will see less birds, but they are more special. Like there's more specific birds because each bird has its own task. They only drink from one flower. They only do one task. I mean, everything is linked. And you will see it as you come to Colombia. So we use a lot of cycling as a tool because for us it's like we're cycling, but also we're listening what it's uh, surrounding us. You will never know, even though you cross that path like several times and hundreds of times, you will never know what it's gonna be on the corner, you know? You don't know what you're gonna hear, you don't know what you're gonna see. Everything is like an adventure. Every single time you go outside, it's an adventure. The route to Chingaza Loop is 420 kilometers with 9,600 meters of climbing. It begins in the Parque Nacional in Bogota and initially climbs over home out of the city. Within 20 kilometers, you turn onto dirt and into a paramos. From there, it's a descent to La Calera, your first opportunity for a hot meal and resupply. A steep cobbled climb leads to farm roads that take you to Zipaquira. The Salt Cathedral here is one of the seven wonders of Colombia. Zipaquira is the hometown of Egon Bernal, the winner of the 2019 Tour de France. The route continues rolling to Sisquile, a great opportunity to spin your legs, acclimate, and prepare for the challenges ahead. And then the real climbing begins. First to Laguna de Guatavita, a sacred lake for the Muisca people and the basis for the legend of El Dorado. It's a roller coaster to Huasca, passing Conservation International project sites along the way. We're working to establish an exchange between farmers and bikepackers. Huasca is the final place to resupply before a long climb to the entrance of Chingaza National Park, the essential paramos that naturally supplies pure drinking water to Bogota. After reaching 3,300 meters above sea level, a permit is required to enter the park. The route traverses the park for 50 kilometers, most of which is above treeline. It's a descent to San Juanito, a good place for a hot meal and resupply. This region used to be occupied by communist rebels. For the first time in decades, visitors are welcome. During the wet season, upwards of 20 waterfalls can be seen from the road along Canyon del Rio Huatiquilla. A rugged and steep stretch leads to the hilltop town of El Calvario. The climbing and terrain in this section of the route is the toughest by far. The vegetation is lush. San Francisco is next, and then there are three significant climbs to the neighboring towns of Fomake and Chuachi. Both are great spots to rest and recover before the final push. 1,800 meters of climbing over 40 kilometers to get to the top of Patios, the most popular road climb for cyclists in Bogota. We recommend seven to 10 days for touring this route. Colombia is a hard place to ride bikes. The mountains are steep, the days are hot, the atmosphere is humid, right? So like there's all this stuff that goes into uh, riding in Colombia, which makes the local cyclists such, such incredible athletes. We are happy people and we're super open for everybody to come and to discover our own place and to acknowledge that you can also ride with us as well. So it's really happy for us just seeing how everything is getting connected and how everyone can also have this route for riding and to try to be Lael and on her insane two day, three day uh, gravel time trial as an additional challenge to our project and a personal challenge, I've decided to be the first person to ride the full 262 mile route as fast as I can. We are at the Parque Nacional, the national park, at the broken clock tower, which is the start of the route. But let's see, it's um, 12.58, 12.59. Two days ago, the Tour of Colombia came right past this point. And now I'm back here two days later with four other guys, so that's pretty nice to have some company. I'm so excited. Oh my gosh, it's like perfect out. These guys are talking about it feeling cold, but it's probably like 45 degrees. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, I think it's gonna be great. You know, the, what I like about this kind of ride is when I get like 12 hours in. So uh, I have some time until then. But I guess I'll do my dark riding in the beginning, which is kind of nice. 
Oh, yeah. Okay, 109, ready, set, go. An FKT is fastest known time. It's when you attempt a route or a climb or some athletic endeavor in the fastest time possible. It's different than a race because really you're just racing against the clock. It's just about sunrise on the first morning and I felt my tire getting super low. Uh, so I just stopped and realized I had a big tear in the tire. Um, and I tried to pump it up a bit, ended up putting a plug in, probably spent the last 15 minutes fixing this, but it's holding air now, so I'm pretty happy about that. Generally with an FKT, the concept is that it's self-supporting. So you're taking care of yourself, your equipment, all your needs along the way. You can, of course, go to stores, they exist for the public, but you can't have a vehicle following you to aid you. You can't have a mechanic. You can't have somebody to draft. Um, it's, it's a solo mission. And then I love this concept to ride this bikepacking route at a fast time in Colombia because this country is in love with cycling and they're very competitive. Lyle has a really good pace, no? Really good pace. Really good pace. She's, she's very focused. She hasn't stopped. She doesn't stop for anything. Oh, nothing. And she hasn't stopped smiling. <laughs> no? No, it was just like being on a group ride with anybody else. Which yeah. is really cool. I think that's what, that's what makes her so cool. Whew. I mean, waking up at midnight, not sleeping that much, and still having that power and, and that like energy that makes her like special, it's, it's true what they say. She's, she's out of this world, she's amazing. As long as she's, she's got enough food and water. She has enough food and water, she's a monster. We've done almost 2,000 elevation game and she's missing another 9,000 elevation game. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna be hard, but she's positive, let's see how it goes. Yeah, she's still smiling. Well, you did well, man. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Thank you for everything. Hope Lyle will, will make it. They're thinking, well, I could ride that route. I could be out there. I want to see what happens if I'm there. What would I do? Where would I sleep? What would I eat? How would I feel? So I feel like adding the element of competition of, of time would just bring more attention, more energy, and more excitement to the route. It's good slow. It's good fast. Take the time that you want to take. Ride the speed you want to ride. Sleep when you want to sleep. Stop where you want to stop. Interact with people. Look at the land. You know, there's no wrong way to do this. The only wrong way to do this is just to not do it. With the FKT and with touring, I don't want to miss out on either of them. I love athletic endeavors. I also love touring and taking my time and spending more time in towns, riding with people, stopping to camp. So I don't want to add more value to one versus the other. I, I think they're different experiences and I like them both. It's all riding. The idea is just to encourage people to kind of find their own way within it. Feel good? Tired? Last 10 miles was pretty tough. But it's done. Oh, little time. Yes. <laughs> Good. Great. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.
I don't know. I, okay, I might try to beat her time. I don't know if I can do it on her insane time, but maybe let's see how it goes. I mean, if I do it, I will be very proud, and, and that would mean that you have to come back again to reclaim your throne. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. If you beat it, I'll come back. I'm definitely sure that there's going to be a Colombian that is going to put his all effort into beat your time. Absolutely. And that's going to happen. So excited. And you know what that's going to happen? It's going to be a small Colombian kid from a town that nobody knows, and he had like a shitty bike. And that's how talents are, you know? In Colombia, you don't know who you're going to... Yeah, that's how uh, that's how these uh, Colombian professionals are, you know. They started as like little kids going to their school on their shitty bike, uh, riding all these insane climbs, and a couple of years later, they're the best in the world. So yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> I think creating a route that is accessible for everyone is a really good decision to make. Bike packing and riding on the bike on these special paths will acknowledge yourself that this is a special place that needs to be protected. Water is one of the most important things in the world. That's undeniable. The fact that Chingaza is responsible for 70% of the water provision of one of the largest cities in South America is incredible. It seems crazy that an ecosystem that's so valuable is threatened, that it's not assured, that we have to work to protect it, despite the fact that we're completely dependent on it. Industries and urban growth are threatening some of these ecosystems in the north of the region. And also you have another phase that is the rural area. We produce potato and we produce milk. It's the highest threat to the farms because the potato crop, it has more production when it's in a wet soil and with a lot of moisture, and that's the paramos. So in rural areas, they actually want to protect the ecosystems, but sometimes the economical way that, that society brings to them, they, are, they don't have the tools to protect that nature. And you start thinking about agriculture as part of a system that you can produce your food, but still protect the nature. I think rural communities start understanding that, understanding that they are important in the system. If they don't protect where they are, that means that people downstream, they are not going to have water. And that way you start thinking about what is my responsibility in the place that I live and what are the benefits that I'm providing downstream or the other way, right? Our work at its core is to make sure that the land use practices that people are doing in those areas does not compromise the water integrity of the whole area. We're helping to establish sustainable livelihood options through conservation agreements. We work heavily with local communities, indigenous communities, because we see them as the stewards of nature. And the truth is, those ecosystems were never threatened until now. They know how to take care of them. It's just they've been marginalized throughout history. We need to learn how to live in harmony with nature again. Bike tourism is going to have a huge potential here because the young people from Bogota is going to use their bike for transport in the city and now they want to go and explore the mountains. It's going to generate an exchange that is very important for the entire conservation program. To start making them feel that they are part of an ecosystem, that route is going to make you feel that way. We are connected. The city is here, but still, this is part of my region. You know, actually, that's, it's funny you ask that because that is the most common question and comments on, on our site is, can I ride this on a gravel bike? And usually the answer is, yeah, you can, but you're probably not going to be happy. <laughs> I mean, you could. You can ride anything on a gravel bike. I think the perfect bike for this route is probably a hardtail, 2.25 and up tires. It's a pretty rough surface. You'll get beat up on smaller tires for sure. Pack light, because the climbs are steep. Bring your big gears. <laughs> yeah. Don't be scared about the water because you're gonna get wet for sure. Bring rain gear and, and warm weather gear because it can change pretty much like that. I think it got down to 30 degrees Fahrenheit when we were in Chingaza. Sounds like it could get down even lower. You can resupply almost every 30K, so it's not really necessary to carry a lot of food. There's some great options there. Rapids are incredible. They kind of vary in different places on the route. 
The ones in Verhoen are big and flat. They're almost crunchy and have a nice texture, but then the ones near Calara are more kind of cheesy and gooey. They're incredible. They're like the perfect cycling food. For meals, it's often chicken and rice and beans with plantains. The route's going to start from the uh, national park in town and go up the climb by Verhoen. Two days a week, Thursdays and Sundays, those roads are used by many other cyclists and they're patrolled. Kind of gets you a nice, comfortable, safe entry and exit with other cyclists. I would recommend to people who are going to do it to come to Bogota and stay in the city for a few days before setting out, acclimatize, take part in Ciclovia, which is amazing, do a couple tours, eat some good food, and then set out, and then come back and do it again. <laughs> if your only exposure to it is what you see on Twitter or see on the news, then you might hold back. That attitude is heartbreaking because the world is complicated. The story isn't just a single valence. It's not just negative and not just positive, where it's the, the beautiful interaction between the way human beings are. Once we start to recognize that and share that idea with each other, then we get to see that a country like Colombia is beautiful, is amazing. We don't go because we're owed it, but we get to learn because we're open to it. And that feels to me like the way we should be. Buenas, buenas noches. Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. It doesn't have to be all doom and gloom. We can connect to nature. We can save our planet in a way that's fun and amazing. We can do it while cycling. Like that's the the amazing thing about this. The concept of creating this route and then encouraging people to go to those natural places, to pedal themselves there, it's really empowering. They can kind of gain an understanding of their own place, of where their needs are coming from, under their own power, with this experience of doing this all outside and actually witnessing the connection of the city to nature and where the water's coming from. That sense of passing through, but with enough humanity and enough vulnerability and enough commitment to the place is, I think, integral to what bikepacking is. You're typically trying to move as light as possible in the environment. That comes in a lot of senses. Of course, your gear is light, but you're also trying to have as little an impact or at least as little negative impact as you can in an environment. A chance to be and see and be respectful of a place and people. That's why I do it, and it hasn't gotten old, not in, not in the 30 years that I've been doing it. If I can cycle up a mountain as a, basically a commuter cyclist, then it kind of makes you feel that you can achieve anything, and that these huge environmental crises that we're facing right now, they seem daunting, but it's also daunting to cycle up a huge mountain. So. That's a feeling I hope that people come away from cycling this route with. That feeling that if you put enough effort into something, you can, you can achieve anything. The pitches are steep. The track is bumpy. The elevation is high. But the rewards kind of meet that ruggedness. 